it's virtually impossible to talk about video games without hearing the word cozy. YouTube videos, Discord servers, and every Nintendo Direct have been invaded by cozy games. Over the last two years, articles about cozy gaming have appeared in major news outlets like the Washington Post and the LA Times. Yahtzee declared cozy games the next big thing in gaming. If you're a consumer of gaming content, you cannot escape the big cozy. The term cozy game generally refers to non-competitive video games that focus on routine tasks like farming or crafting. They emphasize relationships, have loose time limits and very few negative consequences, and tend to feature soft and charming art styles. Some of the most popular types of cozy games are life sims, farm sims, crafting games, and narrative-driven exploration games. You've likely seen these types of games showing up more frequently on your console of choices, coming soon section. As just one example, it is a rare thing to see a Nintendo Direct these days without at least one farm sim in the showcase. If you hadn't been paying attention to cozy games, it may seem as if they appeared out of nowhere all at once. But cozy games have been around for years, decades even. And while there have been some major milestones on the journey to the mainstream market, the most significant was the release of Animal Crossing New Horizons in 2020. Since that game was released, farm sims, life sims, and crafting games have filled up the eShops of nearly every console. If you've ever wanted to run a farm without breaking a sweat, there's never been a better time. In fact, some might argue that we are headed for a cozy game burnout, and I think one recent release really illustrates this. In September, Fay Farm, a highly anticipated farm sim and adventure game, hit the Nintendo eShop at a price tag of $60. Reception was mixed, with some embracing the game and others bemoaning how repetitive, predictable, and overpriced the genre was becoming. I do suspect that this wave of cozy game releases has hit a crescendo and will begin to subside. But I do not think cozy games are a passing trend. While studios looking to make a quick dollar might turn away from cozy gaming when the next trend rolls through, there are several excellent developers that have been making cozy games for years and show no signs of stopping anytime soon. Cozy is now a bona fide standalone genre that will persist long into the future even after this gold rush dies down. How did we get here? How did we go from games like Skyrim, Call of Duty, and Red Dead Redemption, to games like Cozy Grove, Coffee Talk, and Wildflowers? What changes in the culture and in player demographics drove the explosive growth of cozy games? And what needs do these games fill that other genres have failed to deliver on? I have yet to find a deep dive of the cozy game revolution, one that speaks to the history, influences, demographics, and future implications of the genre. And so I offer you this tediously detailed video essay in an attempt to convince you that, far from being a passing trend, cozy gaming is the most revolutionary genre in video game history. What comes to mind when you hear the term cozy game? Harvest Moon, Animal Crossing, Stardew Valley, Cozy Grove? Or maybe you envision a particular look or a vibe. You see, cozy refers to both an aesthetic and a gameplay style. In terms of aesthetics, these games often feature warm, bright, or pastel colors. Characters are cute animals or pleasantly cartoonish humans. The game environment will often include forests, mountains, and cafes, all imbued with an atmosphere of safety and comfort. The sound effects and music tend to be understated, mellow, and acoustic. NPCs often struggle with issues that the player can help them with. These characters are usually friendly and helpful, but even the odd curmudgeon finds their way into a cozy game, usually to provide comic relief or call on a player's ability to empathize. In fact, many cozy games focus heavily on relationship building or repairing. Cozy gameplay tends to be pro-social. Compare this to other games that are violent, hyper-competitive, and zero-sum, and it's easy to see how cozy games became a refuge for players looking for a low-stakes adventure. Obviously, the term cozy now spans thousands of titles, so gameplay will differ. But generally, cozy gameplay is low-stakes, non-competitive, and rarely skills-based. 
Farm sims like Harvest Moon, Stardew Valley, and Wildflowers are probably the most popular cozy subgenre. Other subgenres include sorting games like A Little to the Left, craftathons like Witchwood, and explorative environmental storytelling games like Gone Home. These titles rarely feature fail states or game over screens. The stakes are generally low and there's very little friction. Cozy games can include battle or other more traditional types of friction. Stardew Valley has combat, for example. But unlike other genres, in a cozy game, the friction does not dominate the gameplay experience. So what does? In a word, the vibe. It is worth noting that cozy is a psychological state, one of comfort, contentedness, and relaxation. This implies that what characterizes a cozy game more than any other trait is its ability to induce a feeling of cozy. There are only two genres of video games that are described by emotional states, cozy and horror. Just like a horror game, when we hear the term cozy game, we have some sense, without even playing, as to what we are likely to feel during gameplay. With horror, we will feel fear, unease, maybe anxiety and excitement. With cozy, we will feel the opposite, content and calm. Games from other genres can still be emotionally evocative, but that emotional state is not the defining feature of the genre. So in some ways, what is a cozy game is a trick question. Any game can be cozy, as the most important feature of a cozy game is that it makes the player feel cozy. And this criterion, more than any other, can help us understand the history of this seemingly new genre. Games that could be considered cozy have been around for decades. It is difficult to draw a line in the historical sand, as cozy spans so many subgenres, but I'll try to point out some key milestones. Maybe the most reasonable place to start is with Life Sims. Life Sims have been around since the mid-80s, and in 1989, video game designer Will Wright released SimCity, a sandbox city builder game with no fail or win states, which was a hard sell at the time. So hard, in fact, that the game was rejected by Broderbund, the studio that had originally agreed to publish SimCity. Wright would later co-found a company called Maxis in order to publish the game himself. He has stated that he wanted to develop a game that prioritized creativity and calmness. And in this sense, I feel like SimCity might be the seminal cozy game in that it is the first game I can find that was designed specifically to induce a feeling of cozy. Despite the success of SimCity, its cultural impact pales in comparison to Will Wright's masterpiece. The Sims released on PC in the year 2000. This game was everywhere. Your brother played it? Your mother played it. No, seriously. Will Wright has since stated that over half of The Sims player audience was female, a bit of an anomaly for the time. I found that interesting as a female heavy player base is a trend that continues to hold over into the cozy game communities of today. While The Sims did feature fail states and various catastrophic character endings a la Oregon Trail, the DNA of modern life Sims is all over this game. The lack of an end goal, the management of daily activities, and the building of a house are all familiar elements in today's cozy life sims. But hold your horse game horses. Four years before the release of The Sims, another game hit the market to significant, though not extraordinary, success. And this game, while nowhere near as popular as The Sims, is probably the most influential title in the entire cozy game canon. Harvest Moon, now known as Story of Seasons, I I think, although the copyright issues are a little confusing, I'm really not sure, I'm not a lawyer, go ask Mooney from Moon Channel. To make everyone's lives easy, I'm just going to refer to the series as Harvest Moon. As you likely know, Harvest Moon is a long-standing series of farm simulators. Maxis, Will Wright's company, had released SimFarm in 1993, but unlike SimFarm, Harvest Moon combined elements of farm sims, life sims, and RPGs. Players needed to tend to crops and animals, but were also encouraged to develop relationships with other villagers and attend community events. It's fair to say that the original Harvest Moon, released in Japan in 1996, was responsible for solidifying farm life sims into their own genre. And the conventions that Harvest Moon laid down are still the farm sim standard. You've got a grandparent who left you to care for the farm, 
farmland to clear and crops and livestock to tend to, a mine that can be worked for minerals, a spa in the mountains. It's kind of incredible that these gameplay elements have persisted for this long, but I think that's a testament to Harvest Moon's enduring charm. Harvest Moon on Super Nintendo may not have been a cultural milestone, but it is an important artifact of cozy game history. In the years following the game's release, more farm life simulators began to appear, including Harvest Moon 64 in 1999 and the first Animal Crossing in 2001, which wasn't exactly a farm sim, but did include some of the same mechanics like tending to plants and gathering items. Reading some of the reviews of the first Harvest Moon are retrospectively hilarious. Yeah, who would ever want that? Speaking of farm sims, who remembers the original Farmville? Farmville was a Flash-based Facebook flash in the pan. Those of you who were not playing Facebook games in the 2000s may not even remember it, but it was big. At the height of its popularity, the game saw tens of millions of active daily users. People were addicted. I remember my mother telling me that she would set an alarm for the middle of the night so she could harvest her strawberry crops. As far as I know, Farmville was the first video game my mother ever played. The accessibility and popularity of Facebook allowed Farmville to reach a massive and at the time untapped video game audience. And this is a theme that runs through cozy games. They are accessible. They are rarely skills-based. They are the anti-from software, a stepping stone into a medium that you may have felt too timid to enter. Then, in 2008, a historic event would make video games even more accessible to previously uninterested audiences. The introduction of the iPhone App Store. With the App Store, it was easier than ever to play video games, whether you were particularly interested in them or not. Imagine, if you will, the following scenario. You're all grown up in 2008, and you're still marveling at the amazing new things your phone can do. The future is now. Maybe you played video games in the past, but maybe you didn't. Then the App Store launches, and suddenly you can fill your smartphone with time killers in the form of podcasts, news apps, and games. You used to wait for the bus with your hands jammed into your pockets, staring into the distance, unblinking. Horrifically, you may have even been expected to interact with strangers. But now, now you can grab your iPhone and play a quick round of Enigma instead. Just like that, you've become a gamer. People who may not have played games at all were suddenly playing them every day. For many non-gamers, mobile gaming was the gateway drug, so to speak. But what does this have to do with cozy games? Well, the history of cozy gaming is the history of expanding player demographics. We'll talk more about this later, but for now, just know that social media and mobile gaming help set the stage for the cozy explosion. Cozy gaming is a term that will likely come to be associated with the 2020s, but the tide really began to turn in the 2010s with a couple of influential titles. The most notable might be Minecraft. This game would come to dominate the decade, selling more than 200 million copies, netting nearly $3 billion, and sparking a gigantic and still thriving online community. This runaway indie hit was directionless, with no real end state or goal. But the gameplay loop of building and breaking was addictive, hypnotic even. What you wanted to build, you could build. This free roam ethos was a breath of fresh air at a time when popular games had become painfully linear. This was the heyday of rail shooters, a dark age when even the most famously free wandering games were confined to a series of stylized tunnels. The opportunity to build and explore to your heart's content was refreshing and maybe even revolutionary. It is difficult to imagine today's Tears of the Kingdom Ultra Hand aberrations without a decade of Minecraft under our belts. And Minecraft did more than entertain. Many players found the gameplay loop beneficial to their mental health, so much so that Minecraft therapy emerged. Counselors in the US and UK began to use Minecraft with adolescents, as the sandbox playstyle closely mirrors a child therapeutic method called the World Technique. There are even online group support sessions for adults that are centered around Minecraft and other video games. And if you've spent any time in the cozy gaming community, you know that this is a common thread. 
cozy games seemed to benefit the mental health of many players. Minecraft was massively influential in this regard. It highlighted the potential of gameplay mechanics to positively impact players' well-being. Minecraft also helped instigate an indie studio revival. With the advent of downloadable content in the 2010s, more and more indie developers emerged, many of them authoring downright cozy games, including 2016's Stardew Valley, created by developer Eric Barone. Barone, who goes by the moniker Concerned Ape, was inspired by, what else, the Harvest Moon games, and was interested in creating an experience that was magical, idealistic, and emotionally nuanced. It's difficult to describe just how charming and special this game is. Stardew Valley is one man's labor of love, and that comes across in every moment of gameplay. Audiences responded enthusiastically, and the game was a near instant hit, selling more than 10 million copies between 2016 and 2020. In many ways, Stardew Valley was a more modern take on the farm sim genre, featuring same-sex relationship options and a greater degree of creative control compared to mainstay titles like Harvest Moon. Online communities dedicated to the game are full of players claiming that the game has significantly improved their mental health or helped them weather depressive episodes. In many ways, Stardew Valley was the cozy game tipping point. It was around this time that the term cozy game began to crop up more frequently online. Blog posts on the topic began to appear and Reddit users solicited fellow players for cozy game recommendations. By 2017, Project Horseshoe had published a detailed and amazing report on the function and best practices of cozy games. I will link that report in the description as it is a fascinating read for game nerds and was very influential in the making of this video. Stardew Valley, while a big hit, was but a preview. It was like the pebble of snow that started the cozy avalanche. And when the avalanche finally formed, it hit hard. I think I've made a decent case that Animal Crossing New Horizons was not the first cozy game, but it was indisputably the game that made cozy its own genre. Cozy games did crop up more frequently following Stardew Valley, but this number increased exponentially in the years following New Horizons' release. In the cozy game timeline, there is a before Animal Crossing New Horizons and an after. No discussion of New Horizons can ignore the impact that the pandemic and stay-at-home orders had on the game's numbers. While this game would have been successful regardless of the pandemic, the social isolation drove a significant amount of sales. Within four months of release, the game had sold more than 22 million copies. The ability to visit your friends and family's islands at a time when you couldn't visit their homes was novel and needed. Add to that the cozy gaming essentials of crafting, planting, collecting, and decorating, and you had a balm to help alleviate the pandemic-induced isolation and stress. As was the case with Stardew Valley, blogs, YouTube videos, and Reddit posts began to appear, extolling the mental and social benefits that New Horizons could confer. Over the last decade, it has become more socially acceptable to speak openly about mental health issues like anxiety, depression, and trauma. By extension, it has become more common to see people discussing how video games have benefited their mental health. I know that in 2023 this might seem laughable, but there was a time in the 80s and 90s when the media were obsessed with the idea that video games were ruining the minds of children. Back then, it was assumed that video games made you lazy at best and violent at worst. The idea that they could be emotionally beneficial wasn't really part of the conversation. Oh, how the times have changed. Cozy gaming, more than any other genre, has demonstrated the potential of video games to benefit our health and well-being. And because video games are more interactive than most other forms of art, they are uniquely suited to induce specific experiences or emotions in the player. We are seeing this fact acknowledged by experts in other fields in the case of video game counseling. It's great that mental health experts have recognized the potential benefit of video games. But has the video game industry recognized its potential to improve players' mental health? 
Some cozy games are developed with the player's well-being in mind, especially as it relates to social connectedness. The Animal Crossing series was made to help assuage the creator's feelings of isolation after moving to a big city. They wanted to make a game that would allow people to feel socially connected. There are also many games, cozy or otherwise, that feature narratives related to mental health or trauma. In rare instances, like Omori, symptoms of mental illness are actually worked into the gameplay mechanics. Games like Omori and Celeste help us contextualize our experience with mental illness or better understand our loved ones with these issues. These games give us insights, and insights can be beneficial, but I don't see a ton of games whose mechanics are intended to bolster our mental wellness beyond insight. I do think games like Animal Crossing that emphasize empathy and socialization do fit into this category. Many people with social anxiety find real connection and relief through Animal Crossing and other similar games. Cozy games in general are often designed to relax us, which is beneficial as well. Look, maybe I'm asking too much video games here, but I really think there is a gap in the commercial market for games that are strategically designed to improve our mental health. To my knowledge, the only video game with mechanics designed intentionally to benefit its player's mental health is a free cozy mobile game called Kinder World. This is not sponsored, by the way. This game includes evidence-based activities that have been shown to benefit our well-being when practiced consistently, such as emotional naming, box breathing, and gratitude journaling. A central mechanic of the game is the ability to send kind messages to other players as evidence demonstrates that helping others improves our own mental health and sense of being. While many cozy developers do keep their players' emotional well-being in mind, Kinder World has taken this one step further by examining the scientific evidence and using that information to create a soothing gameplay loop. Like all good cozy games, Kinder World features cute animals, cozy decorating options, and an honestly awesome lo-fi soundtrack. The development team has a wellness researcher who helps conduct research on mental health and gaming. This researcher works with the designers and programmers to craft a healthy and comforting experience for the player. I don't know for certain, but I suspect this may be the only commercial video game that has a wellness researcher on its development team. I hope that Kinder World will be just the first of many cozy games to take a more intentional and strategic approach to game design in regards to mental health. Obviously, not every genre of video game is going to be conducive to this, but cozy games are a natural fit. Kinder World also heavily promotes their Discord server to foster positive connections between players. If you spend any amount of time in cozy communities online, then you know that they are friendly and accepting in nature, mirroring the vibe of most cozy games. When taking a quick scan through various cozy game communities, I noticed that a large majority of users appeared to be or identified as female. And while people of all genders enjoy cozy games, there's no secret as to who dominates these online communities. The cozy game community is noticeably female forward. Most cozy game YouTube channels are run by females and most of those females are under 30 years old. Historically, this is not a player demographic that most developers catered or marketed to. That doesn't mean that there weren't female video games or gamers prior to cozy gaming. Yours truly started playing video games in 1993. But this level of female gender representation in a video game community is frankly historic. For years, the gender composition of gamers has inched closer and closer to a 50-50 split, although there are definitely variances by genre. It is estimated that 46% of all gamers are female. I don't think that the cozy game craze significantly increased the amount of female gamers. But I do suspect that female gamers are playing more video games more frequently because of the cozy gold rush. This isn't science, but every female gamer I know, every single one, loves cozy games. This is true regardless of age, although as a 36-year-old, most of the female gamers I know are in their 30s or 40s. And data do show that the average age of gamers continues to increase over time. While researching this video, I found a blog that was dedicated to cozy games and the idea that they could be a great de-stressor for older women. 
I've been playing video games for a very long time now, but I have fallen into the cozy game Vortex with joyful abandon, and have to admit that most of the games I purchase these days are indie cozy games. Cozy games tend to be more bite-sized than bingeable, which is great for a time in life when career, family, and other non-recreational priorities tend to dominate. I also found an article which stated that Nintendo bought ad space for Animal Crossing New Horizons in Vogue. I'll admit, I couldn't find this ad when leaking through Vogue's archives, maybe I missed it, or maybe it ran online, but if this is true, that means that Nintendo was advertising in a magazine with a majority female readership and an average reader age range of 25 to 40 years old. In other words, middle-aged women. This is not a marketing channel that most game developers have poured resources into. I did try to find concrete data on cozy game player demographics, but quickly learned that reliable video game demographic data are very difficult to come by. So we have to rely on what we can observe publicly. And what I see is an ever-widening audience of gamers. Elderly, middle-aged, female. Change is afoot in the industry. And in many respects, cozy games are at the forefront of that change. But, of course, women aren't the only people playing cozy games. At time of recording, I know that more than 75% of my viewers are male. So I ask you all, regardless of your gender or age, do you play cozy games? If so, why, and which ones do you most enjoy? Let me know in the comments. I would love to know more about what motivates people to play these games. Changing demographics are a key reason that cozy games have exploded in popularity. But video game demographics are not the only thing in flux. We know from the New Horizons case study that the pandemic left many people stressed, overwhelmed, and lonely, and that this helped to fuel the demand for cozy games. But there were other cultural changes that also drove demand. During the pandemic, many of us were laid off, had our hours cut, or couldn't find a job. If we hadn't already known, we were abruptly confronted by the fact that our employers didn't value us that much. For those of us who were lucky enough to keep our jobs and work from home, we had more time than we ever thought we would to reflect on our lives. Many people, regardless of circumstance, faced a moment of reckoning. In a world where external authorities couldn't offer satisfactory solutions, we saw an entire cultural shift towards intrinsic motivation. With such a sharp and drastic drop-off of external motivation, people were left to wonder, what motivates me when no one else is here to tell me what to do? Cozy games are, I think, a safe space to explore some of these questions. Do you want to farm? Do you want to forge relationships? Do you want to maximize profit or do something else entirely? In the real world, you are under a constant threat of failure, and some people are more affected by this potential than others. Games that give us opportunities to try things we may want to do in real life but don't have the means or gumption to try allow us to explore some semblance of these experiences without assuming any of the associated risks. Want to make friends but have social anxiety? Why not practice those skills in Animal Crossing? Want to dye your hair blue, but are too afraid of being judged by your family? Well, throw that blue dew on your avatar. Want to grow vegetables, but are afraid you'll accidentally kill your plants? Well, let's give it a go in a farm sim. And just as Minecraft was an open-ended antidote to Rails gameplay, cozy games today are the inverse. They are a safe and enclosed experience that can feel comforting and predictable against the endless backdrop of open world games. Most cozy games feel less daunting than the do anything, go anywhere, open world structure of AAA games. I don't think it's a coincidence that many, perhaps too many of these games are centered around farming. I remember the pandemic sparking a sort of pastoral fantasy revival. How many of us threatened to walk away from it all and go live in the woods somewhere? Pastoral fantasies have always been just that, fantasies. Most of us would, if we were honest, prefer not to grow all of our food or slaughter our animals or till our fields. Life on the farm is hard. The pastoral fantasy speaks to the softer side of the rural lifestyle. Living in harmony with nature, disconnecting from the demands of modern technology, living in a small community where every member is recognized for adding value, 
you know, the cozy stuff. It can be easy to dismiss these desires as escapist or naive, but it's not an all-or-nothing proposition. We can recognize the realities of modern life while hoping and maybe even working towards something just a tad more pleasant. And this is the key to understanding just how revolutionary cozy gaming really is. Cynical art has become the norm. Every piece of art seems burdened with the need to expose corruption and injustice and, this part is key, to treat both as static and impossible to change, as hopeless, essentially. There will always be a need for dark art, dour art, cynical art, art that exposes corruption, and yes, even art that speaks to the real hopelessness of certain situations. But the entire cultural canon does not need to meet these criteria. Aspirational art has come to be seen as almost reductive or naive, even apathetic. But with some notable exceptions, art that can only invoke negative feelings is uninspired. That's because making other people feel bad is very easy to do. Making other people feel hopeful, determined, loving, or content requires more finesse. I long for aspirational art, art that doesn't attempt to cover our eyes to the struggles of the world, but that does attempt to envision a more hopeful future, one that speaks to our higher qualities and our potential as humans. I doubt I'm the only one craving this, as I think it is this precise need that cozy games fill. Some describe cozy games as escapist, and if that's how you play them, more power to you. I think cozy games go a step beyond escapist and land squarely in the realm of aspirational. They help us cultivate aspirations for our world and ourselves. Change is often born of desperation and despair, but it must also include a vision for the future. If we do crave change, we need art that exposes and art that inspires. While I don't think we will live in a pastel-colored cozy paradise anytime soon, I do think the popularity of cozy games can give us some insight into the aspects of our culture that are wearing many of us down. Hyper-competition and the drive to out-earn or outwork our fellow humans. Divisiveness and the tendency to devalue ourselves and others. Cynicism and seeing every negative event as evidence that the world is ending and isn't even worth saving anyway. To only view the world through these lenses is exhausting, depressing, and ultimately demotivating. Art that exposes the uglier side of life is important. But art that just depresses or demotivates us borders on sadistic. Now more than ever, we need art that inspires us, that offers us a vision of a future that we might actually want to be a part of. In short, we need art that empowers us. Cozy games are the hero we need and deserve, and that they offer us a glimpse into our better natures and provide us with opportunities to develop skills that will be needed in a more palatable future. Skills like cooperation, empathy, forgiveness, creativity, and self-direction. I really can't put it much better than the Project Horseshoe Report did, so I'll just offer you an abridged excerpt. In a time of increasing divisiveness, othering, and rampant fear, Coziness, in that it provides safety, softness, and the satisfaction of needs, is a powerful and necessary subversion of current culture. And that coziness enables us to express our whole selves without ramification. It is healing and validating in a hypercritical world. And that coziness encourages the positive resolution of conflict, it is deeply mending to our societal divides. In that coziness elevates the softer, gentler aspects of life, it brings relief from fear. In that coziness creates spaces of plenty, it provides focus amongst chaos and allows us to embrace our highest level and most human pursuits. In that coziness offers us spaces of choice, it allows us to explore our underlying intrinsic motivations. Coziness is healing, validating, collaborative, and kind. Coziness is relief and refuge and gentle opportunity. In a harsh, demanding ecosystem of cynically generated needs and unending urgency, coziness creates comfort and freedom and a path to a better world. 
with its roots in indie development, unique ability to benefit mental health, subversion of cultural norms, and audacity to be aspirational, Cozy is the most punk rock genre in video game history. And with that, I rest my case. Thanks everyone so much for watching. I recently created a Patreon page. If you do want to contribute, click on the link in the description below. All patrons, regardless of donation level, will have early ad-free access to my videos before I make them public. If that is something that interests you, please consider signing up. Stay cozy, friends. Wow.